the 31st annual Sydney B. Sperry Symposium, Go Ye Into All the World, Messages of the New Testament Apostles. The following presentation, Submit Yourselves as Unto the Lord, was given by Dr. Camille Franck from BYU's Religious Education. It is truly a privilege for me to be invited to participate in this Sydney B. Sperry Symposium, and I do hope that the message that I've prepared um, will be complementary to what Brother Sperry represented in the legacy that he left behind, and perhaps even more so to the truths of the New Testament that we are studying with this symposium. As a divinely appointed witness for Christ, the Apostle Paul spoke without flattering words, giving messages that were not always pleasing to men, but pleasing to God. We should not be surprised, then, if we feel our toes stepped on from time to time when we read Paul's epistles. Such a reaction generally means that he's just uncovered a gospel principle that we have not yet fully understood or faithfully followed. This discomfort is particularly felt, I believe, in Paul's instruction concerning women. He declared, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11.3, the head of the woman is the man. In Ephesians 5.22, he said, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. And 1 Corinthians 14.34 says, Let your women keep silence in the churches. <clears throat> Many of us have reacted to these hard sayings by scrambling for the footnotes, hoping for a Joseph Smith translation insight <laughs> or another possible translation of the Greek that would exonerate Paul from a politically incorrect faux pas. When that fails, we usually respond in one of three ways. First, we may write off Paul's teachings to women as strictly cultural for a first century Judeo-Roman world, and therefore not applicable to us today. Secondly, we may use Paul's words to justify patronizing or belittling women, concluding that women are not equipped to think for themselves, let alone teach doctrines of salvation. This reaction includes biblical humor using Paul's words as fodder to poke fun at women. Finally, we may accuse Paul of chauvinism or even misogyny concluding that he's blind to women's contributions to the growth of the church and strength of society. I propose a different response, one that adds nobility and stature to both men and women of Christ, while garnering greater reverence for an apostle, an apostle who boldly professed God's eternal laws. Upon closer consideration, Paul's statements say as much about men's stewardship in leadership as they do about women's submission, both within the family and in the church. At a time when strengthening the family and improving communication between the sexes are standard sermons by general church leaders, Paul's counsel is needed today as much as ever. To begin, consider the cultural milieu for women in Paul's day. Since Paul's epistles were written to address specific concerns within the early Christian church, identifying cultural characteristics of his audience helped to elucidate timeless gospel principles equally applicable to our day. Striking differences are apparent in women's opportunities among the Jews as compared to Gentile women in the Roman Empire at this time. In Jewish society, women's roles and functions were restrictive. Married women were limited in education and inheritance rights, while generally being confined to home. During the time of the Savior's ministry among the Jews, Jewish women were typically seen as being without status, voice, or any quality of life without a man's providential care. By contrast, in Roman cities, educating women was considered very important. Poorer families were at least able to offer their daughters an elementary education. Daughters in more affluent homes were taught by personal tutors. For example, in Corinth and Rome, 
women could initiate divorce proceedings for any reason and were free to manage their own property. In cities like Ephesus in Asia Minor and Thessalonica in Macedonia, women could own private businesses, hold public office, and perform significant roles in various temple rituals. Among Paul's converts were many of this Roman culture, such as what we read in Acts as chief women in Thessalonica, and honorable women, Greek women, in Berea. Lydia, a businesswoman from Thyatira in Asia Minor who sold expensive purple dye, was Paul's first convert in Philippi. The spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire in the first century AD reflects the potential for misunderstanding of priesthood authority on cultures where tradition either marginalized women or erased role distinction. 2,000 years later, many women in and outside the home perceive themselves as patronized and ignored or encouraged to transform themselves into clones of their male colleagues. Priesthood authority may then translate into further seclusion of women or attempts to curtail their, um, their unique voice. Certainly, Paul's teachings have as much potential to address men and women's stewardship within our own Christian society as the audience that first encountered them. An understanding of those roles, however, is discovered by knowing Christ and following His example. Therefore, let us first consider submissiveness as Christ manifested it. Paul taught that the head of Christ is God, or in other words, Christ is submissive to God. A search in any dictionary or thesaurus reveals quite an interesting list of synonyms for the characteristic submissive, such as obedient, pliable, meek, unpretentious, spineless, flexible, long-suffering, sheepish, modest, henpecked, shrinking, apologetic, gentle, humble, subservient, and forbearing. When the list is applied to the Savior, some of these synonyms simply don't fit. Unquestionably, Jesus is humble, meek, gentle, and unpretentious in his perfect obedience to the Father. But handpecked, spineless, and apologetic? Certainly, we don't conclude from Paul's statement that Christ is merely a puppet in God's hands or inferior in any way. We acknowledge both the Father and the Son as equally glorious members of the Godhead, with two equally important yet distinct roles to bring about salvation for humankind. In His unique role, Christ leads us back to God because He is submissive to God. Consequently, we have unsurpassed reverence for the Savior, feeling to thank Him continually for His strength of character supreme wisdom, devotion to covenant, and selfless love for the Father and each of us. When one uses Christ as the personification of submission, a deeper definition unfolds. True submission requires restraint when one upmanship is possible, the complete absence of pride when recognition is meted out, Strength to st stay the spirit-directed course when letting go may be expected or even rewarded. When Satan tempted Jesus to display glory, he restrained himself from showcasing the breadth of his powers. When converted individuals desired baptism, Jesus himself baptized not so many as his disciples, preferring one another. On the cross, he manifested unparalleled strength and magnificently accomplished the mission his Father sent him to do. Meekness begets meekness. One who is submissive inspires others to have the courage to change, to admit weakness, to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him. 
whether faced by goodness or evil, the Savior exercised restraint, humility, and commitment to the Father's cause. Through his example of submission, his disciples then and now have the courage to do likewise. Recognizing submission in Jesus Christ provides an appropriate definition when the term is applied to women in our desire to become like Christ. Remembering back to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Paul admonished, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. The general context of this 1 Corinthians passage addresses interactions of saints in a church setting rather than within the family. But Paul's counsel about men being the head of women in this epistle therefore invites us to consider these dynamics within a church leadership context. But to the Ephesians in chapter 5, Paul taught that the same leadership and submission roles exist within the family. He wrote, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Paul perceived a responsibility for women to be submissive to men in both a familial and ecclesiastical setting. Women who exercise submission with a husband at home and a priesthood leader at church begin to illuminate the power of a woman's perspective and voice. For example, discover Chloe, a member of the early Christian church who lived in Corinth. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians was written in response to this woman's sensitivity to contentions in the Corinthian branch. Very little is recorded about Chloe and her household in Corinth, except that Paul acknowledged their report. This lengthy and doctrinally rich epistle identifying the destructive ramifications of disunity is evidence of Paul's respect for a woman's perceptions in spiritual matters. Remembering that the vast majority of synonyms for the word submissive indicate a highly desirable trait, why do we think it means sheepish, spineless, or apologetic when it's then used to describe women? Submission is neither giving in to a man's unrighteousness nor giving up on encouraging a man in his potential. In the scriptural context, being submissive does not require women to become doormats for men to walk on. On the contrary, submission requires remarkable strength of character devotion to covenant, unusual wisdom, and selfless love, reminiscent of the exemplary submissive one. Furthermore, a broader study of the Bible reveals that Paul did not originate the responsibility for a woman to be submissive. The Lord ordained that role from the very beginning. In the Garden of Eden, God gave woman the assignment of help meet because man needed a complement being unable to accomplish his mission alone. The Hebrew word etzer, translated as help, infers strength to succor, support, or rescue. The word meet in, in Greek is kenegdo, which means equal to or appropriate for. Eve and her daughters were created by God to be a help to Adam and his sons who are their equals. God knew that men and women would need each other to accomplish their missions and reach their full potential. God's tutelage for Eve did not end at creation. He empowered her with desires to fulfill her stewardship before she and Adam left the garden. Not only did man and woman need each other to depart from the garden and commence mortality, God knew they would need each other to sojourn successfully in a fallen world. So after both Adam and Eve had partaken of the tree of knowledge, God strengthened Eve in her assignment to be a helpmeet to Adam by giving her a desire toward her husband. God gave her an inclination to support, encourage, and remain with her husband as 
Adam honored his role to rule or preside or be head of the woman. Elder M. Russell Ballard said, quote, We believe that the church simply will not accomplish what it must without women's faith and faithfulness, without their innate tendency to put the well-being of others ahead of their own and their strength and tenacity. End of quote. These gifts from God encourage both the partnership God ordained between man and woman as well as their ability to develop their complementary stewardships. A young returned sister missionary attending BYU taught me that lesson. She described her feelings of discomfort with the assignment of tracting and uh, door-to-door and contacting on the street at the commencement of her mission. By contrast, she noticed the boldness, courage, and even enthusiasm that the elders of her mission displayed when they were actively proselytizing. She reasoned, why couldn't the sisters be assigned to nurture visitors who attended the church meetings, which she loved to do and the elders seemed to ignore, and let the men go out and find the people to teach, a task which they seemed to enjoy and do so much better. Then she began to notice elders who had been out for nearly two years without losing their courage to boldly bear witness of the restored gospel whenever or wherever they saw opportunity, they also were becoming more sensitive, nurturing, and encouraging to those who had already committed to baptism. About the same time, she said, she recognized what was happening to her as she matured on her mission experience. She was losing her fear of tracting. She was becoming more confident in speaking up and bearing witness while at the same time becoming more effective in encouraging new members by showing greater sensitivity to their needs. Because elders and sisters worked together in a holy cause, they strengthened each other to develop their complementary responsibilities and the work of the Lord progressed. Most of the confusion, frustration, and anger surrounding the principle of women's submissiveness is grounded in personal experience, I believe, personal experience with men who assume that being head of a woman is a license for fathers, husbands, church leaders, and men in general to abuse, neglect, dominate, belittle, and disrespect women. When such blatant mistreatment comes at the hands of men ordained to the priesthood, a woman may be cautious or even repulsed by instructions from the Apostle Paul to submit to a man. President Gordon B. Hinckley cautioned, Some men who are evidently unable to gain respect by the goodness of their lives use as justification for their actions the statement that Eve was told that Adam should rule over her. How much sadness, how much tragedy, how much heartbreak has come has been caused through centuries of time by weak men who have used that as a scriptural warrant for atrocious behavior. They do not recognize that the same account indicates that Eve was given as a helpmeet to Adam. The facts are that they stood side by side in the garden. They were expelled from the garden together and they worked together, gaining their bread by the sweat of their brows." End of quote. More recently, last April General Conference, President Hinckley has been even more specific in his warning. Quote, How tragic and utterly disgusting a phenomenon is wife abuse. Any man in this church who abuses his wife, who demeans her, who insults her, who exercises unrighteous dominion over her is unworthy of hold, to hold the priesthood. Though he may have been ordained, the heavens will withdraw. The Spirit of the Lord will be grieved, and it will be amen to the, priest, the authority of the priesthood of that man. Any man who engages in this practice is unworthy to hold a temple recommend. There are men who cuff their wives about, both verbally and physically. End of quote. In an attempt to protect herself from such offense, a woman may become more aggressive directive, or even vow to prove that men are not needed in society at all. In short, varying connotations of head 
have confused the lesson Paul was communicating about submission. The Greek word kephle, translated as head, has been the source of countless word studies and commentaries, producing a variety of suggested meanings. Listen to four different suggested scholarly definitions and see if any of these fit in your estimation. First one, does head mean source or origin, referring to Adam as the source of Eve? Secondly, preeminence, as the head has preeminence over the body. Three, authority over or leader. And finally, foremost, as in a military context, not a chief or captain who rules from a safe distance, but one who went before the troops, the first one into battle. Examining the scriptural context provides the clarifying key to understand the meaning of head, I believe. Before Paul instructed man to be head of woman, he reminded the Corinthian saints that as a man, he also had the responsibility to be submissive. He wrote in 1 Corinthians, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And the head of every man is Christ. Submission, therefore, must be included in our understanding of Christ-like leadership in men. Again, consider Christ as the example. If we appreciate how Christ led, we will understand the meaning of man's leadership role in connection with women. Jesus was the perfect leader as head of all God's children. Like the review of synonyms for submission, a review of meanings for head, preside, and lead produces potential for negative and positive connotations. Consider this array of synonyms. Control, supervise, direct, manage, guide, trailblaze, take precedence, command, regulate, pioneer, boss, dictate, innovate, warlord, show the way, and conduct. Which of these words describe Christ's role as our perfect leader while at the same time reflecting his submission to the Father? Which words do not? Jesus taught his disciples, Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ served those over whom he presided. He took initiative to act and give direction when challenges arose. He found solutions to problems and involved others in the process. He healed the infirm and was not afraid to praise the faith of those he healed. Because of his selfless leadership, men and women desired to minister unto him of their substance. Jesus led by living what he taught. He admonished his disciples to pray always, but it was after hearing him pray that the disciples wanted to pray when they petitioned, Lord, teach us to pray. He even asked his disciples to pray for him. Jesus listened without being condescending. He spoke candidly and openly without concern over rejection, trusted his disciples to participate in his demanding work, and worked alongside them without fearing he would disappoint them. Of his leadership style, President Spencer W. Kimball said, quote, Jesus was concerned with basics in human nature and in bringing about lasting changes, not simply cosmetic changes, end of quote. Christ was fearless in preaching and doing truth, while at the same time humble and accepting. He was more concerned with the welfare of souls than the opinions of men. We love and reverence the Savior because he gives clear direction, valiantly blazes a trail we can follow, and never ceases to point us in the direction of the Father. Christ's example of leadership illustrates how men were divinely assigned to be leaders. 
Paul's declaration that man is the head of woman in church and family settings does not then suggest controlling, commanding, demanding, managing, or being a warlord. When God created man and woman, he gave them both dominion over all of his other creations. In other words, the responsibility of dominion was not solely given to man, but to both man and woman together. Being head does not then infer that man has dominion over woman, even when the Lord told Eve that her husband was to rule over her. President Hinckley's interpretation of that statement was, quote, the husband shall have a governing responsibility to provide for, to protect, to strengthen, and shield the wife. The challenge is not in recognizing that God assigned such differing responsibilities to his sons and daughters, but in inspiring men and women to work harmoniously and complementarily in their assigned roles. Adding to the complexity of this task is recognizing that priesthood leadership functions differently in the home than it does in the church. President Boyd K. Packer described that difference. I think this is monumental. In the church, our service is by call. In the home, our service is by choice. In the church, there is a distinct line of authority. We serve where called by those who preside over us. In the home, it's a partnership with husband and wife equally yoked together. While the husband, the father, has responsibility to provide worthy and inspired leadership, his wife is neither behind him nor ahead of him, but at his side." End of quote. Priesthood leadership follows a vertical pattern in the church, with every person's church calling following a line of authority through those men called to preside over them, eventually reaching up to the president of the church. This clarification may provide insight for Paul's instruction, let your women keep silence in the churches. Some biblical scholars discount the passage altogether by explaining it as the work of an interpolator, since it appears to contradict Paul's earlier acknowledgement that women prayed and prophesied in churches, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11. Others suggest that Paul was forbidding women to teach doctrine, not from speaking in general. Can I just tell you, these definitions make me tremble. I would definitely not only be out of a job, but um, would be in some back corner with um, not being able to express the thoughts of my heart. So I look farther into this text to see there's got to be another explanation. The chapter context gives the background for a very different interpretation for women's silence. The text describes church meetings in Corinth when people spoke, um, spoke in tongues without an interpreter and where there was general confusion and disruption. Moreover, the Greek word hesuchia, sometimes translated as silence, suggests a state of rest and contentment or a desistence from bustle or language, as in the manner in which Paul exhorted Thessalonian men to cease from being busybodies and idle working with quietness. For these reasons, one scholar concluded that by using the same Greek word in his epistles, Paul intended that the Thessalonian men be at peace with their work and that the Corinthian women give peaceful support to their church leaders. This view is further strengthened by the Joseph Smith translation insight in the subsequent phrase there in 1 Corinthians 14, which speaks of women as, for it is not permitted for them to rule in the church. Women are at liberty to speak, bear witness, teach, and offer perspectives. Aren't we glad? <laughs> but not to, be, to provide priesthood leadership in the church. No matter how much practical leadership training some of these Corinthian women may have received in their businesses and careers, very possibly, I believe, more than some of the men who were called as their presiding authorities, they were never commissioned by God to be overseers, overseers in the Corinthian branch. At church, the head of the woman is a man in a hierarchical priesthood leadership position. In the home, the pattern of priesthood leadership is horizontal 
as President Packer described. Much of family disharmony over headship occurs when the church application is practiced in the home. In an address during the priesthood, a priesthood session of General Conference, President Howard W. Hunter taught, quote, a man who holds the priesthood accepts his wife as an equal partner in the leadership of the home and family with full knowledge of and full participation in all decisions relating thereto. Of necessity, there must be in the church and the home a presiding officer. By divine appointment, the responsibility to preside in the home rests upon the priesthood holder. For a man to operate independently of or without regard to the feelings and counsel of his wife in governing the family is to exercise unrighteous dominion." End of quote. In our most recent General Relief Society conference, just a little over a month ago, President Faust taught the women of the church, quote, a righteous husband is the bearer of the priesthood, which priesthood is the governing authority of the home. But he is not the priesthood. He is the holder of the priesthood. His wife shares the blessings of the priesthood with him. He is not elevated in any way above the divine status of his wife." End of quote. A missionary couple that we read about in the New Testament, Priscilla and Aquila, exemplify the partnership that President Hunter and President Faust described. Between them, both Paul and Luke acknowledged Aquila and Priscilla six times in the New Testament for their contribution to the work of the church. Together, Priscilla and Aquila provided their home as the Christian meeting house, expounded the gospel to Apollos, who was described as an eloquent man who was already mighty in scripture by bringing him into the gospel fold. And as Paul identified them, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. In his final farewell in 2 Timothy, Paul identified Prisca and Aquila among the stalwarts in the gospel while the greater church was sinking into apostasy. Aquila's inclusion of Priscilla in missionary labors strengthened him in successes and in missionary challenges. A pastor by the name of John Piper wrote a remarkable description of what he called mature masculinity his term for divinely inspired headship based on the Apostle Paul's teachings. Here is a synopsis of his description. First, he said, mature masculinity expresses itself not in the demand to be served, but in the strength to serve and to sacrifice for the good of the woman. Second, he said, Mature masculinity does not have to initiate every action, but feels the responsibility to provide a general pattern of initiative. For example, the leadership pattern would be less than biblical if the wife in general was having to take the initiative in prayer at mealtime and give, get the family out of bed for worship on Sunday morning and gather the family for devotions and discuss what moral standards would, will be required of the children and confer about financial priorities, etc. Finally, mature masculinity recognizes that the call to leadership is a call to repentance and humility and risk-taking. He went on to say, in a good marriage, decision-making decision is focused on the husband, but is not unilateral. He seeks input from his wife and often adopts her ideas. His awareness of his sin and imperfection will guard him from thinking that following Christ gives him the ability of Christ and will guard him um, to know what's best in every detail. Nevertheless, he concluded, in a well-ordered biblical marriage, the husband will accept the burden of making the final choice." End of quote. In our most recent general conference, remember, Elder F. Melvin Hammond of the Seventy gave a very similar counsel to men who serve as head in families. He taught, quote, every father in the church should function as the patriarch of his home. He should take the lead in spiritually guiding the family. He ought not to delegate nor abrogate his responsibilities to the mother. He should call for family prayer, 
family home evening, scripture reading, and occasional father interviews. He is protector, the defender, and the kindly source of discipline. It is the father who should lead, unify, and solidify the family unit by accepting the priesthood of God and responding to the calls and privileges associated with priesthood authority. His relationship with God and His Son, Jesus Christ, is one of the beacons which will lead His sons and daughters through the stormy shoals of life." End of quote. When a man initiates goodness and respects the knowledge and insight that women provide, He's honoring his stewardship to preside or be head of woman. This requires humility that comes from submission. For as Paul cautioned, the head of every man is Christ. When man leads as God directs, they do not see themselves as their family's savior, but do all they can to lead each family member to know God in Jesus Christ, the true savior. Two illustrations provide examples of how God's pattern works when men and women honor their respective responsibilities. First, let me share a parable that Elder Boyd K. Packer told of how men and women need each other to obtain the greatest blessings of God. This was several years ago, perhaps you might remember. A man inherited two keys, one to a vault and the other to a safe within the vault. He was told that the treasure inside the safe would produce blessings that are continually replenished for all eternity if he worthily used the contents to benefit others. The man went alone to the vault. His first key opened the door. He tried to unlock the treasure with the other key, but he could not, for there were two locks on the safe. His key alone would not open it. No matter how he tried, he could not open it. He was puzzled. He had been given the keys. He knew the treasure was rightfully his. He had obeyed the instructions, but he could not open the safe. In due time, there came a woman into the vault. She too held a key. It was noticeably different from the key he held. Her key fit the other lock. It humbled him to learn that he could not obtain his rightful inheritance without her. They made a covenant that together they would open the treasure, and as instructed, he would watch over the vault and protect it. She would watch over the treasure. She was not concerned that as guardian of the vault, he held two keys, for his full purpose was to see that she was safe as she watched over that which was most precious to both of them. Together they opened the safe and partook of their inheritance. They rejoiced, for as promised, it replenished itself. Because some tempted them to misuse their treasure, they were careful to teach their children about keys and covenants. There came in due time among their posterity some few who were deceived or selfish or jealous because one was given two keys and another only one. Why, the selfish one reasoned, cannot the treasure be mine alone to use as I desire? Those who received the treasure with gratitude and obeyed the laws concerning it knew joy without bounds through time and all eternity." End of quote. God's blessings are not diminished with different assignments. On the contrary, combining our complementary responsibilities and as men and women magnifies the gifts and opportunities God gives to us. Neither man nor woman can obtain the fullness of God's promises without the other. Elder Russell M. Nelson provided a second example of men's and women's complementary responsibilities with a recounting of his family's river rafting vacation. The first time the family approached the dangerous rapids and a waterfall, Elder Nelson explained that his, fam his fatherly instinct was to hold them close to me, he said. But as we reached the precipice, the bended raft became a giant sling and shot me into the air. He said, I landed into the roiling rapids of the river. I fa finally found the side of the raft and rose to the surface. The family pulled my nearly drowned body out of the water. Lucky for him, he had a helpmeet, one who was his equal with strength to help and rescue. 
With all humility and honesty, Elder Nelson then described the most important responsibility a father has in leading his family. When they faced the most dangerous drop of the journey, Elder Nelson initiated a family council meeting where a plan of survival was outlined. As the one who presides, he directed his family not to hold on to him this time, but to hang on to the only thing that would keep them afloat, the ropes secured to the raft. Lucky for the family, they had a father who was submissive to the Lord and knew how to lead them to him. Elder Nelson's lesson is clear. Quote, as we go through life, even through very rough waters. A father's instinctive impulse is to cling tightly to his wife or to his children, and they may not be the, which may not be the best way to accomplish his objective. Instead, he said, if he will lovingly cling to the Savior and the iron rod of the gospel, his family will want to cling to him and to the Savior." End of quote. When a man uses his position as head to lead those within his priesthood leadership to Christ, and a woman actively sustains that focus, families are strengthened and individuals fortified in their connection to God. Now as a summary, in Paul's day, disunity and contention plagued the early Christian church in a variety of ways including confusion and competition over men's and women's differing God-given responsibilities. In our day, Elder M. Russell Ballard observed, the adversity is having a heyday distorting attitudes about gender and roles and about families and individual worth. He's the author of Mass Confusion about the value, the role, the contribution, and unique nature of women. The Apostle Paul boldly restated God's order to invite unity in Christ by, in, by emphasizing the necessity of submission in every relationship. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. No amount of manipulation of these dynamics will make the world a better place. No misinterpretation of presiding and submitting will finally make right either unrighteous dominion or relinquishing a voice. Only by submitting to God's order are we empowered to lift each other to become what God promised we could be. For what man would not gladly sacrifice, actively serve, and more meekly guide a woman who sincerely trusts, unpretentiously follows, and wholeheartedly supports his Christ-like attempts to lead. And what woman would not willingly and joyfully cooperate with a husband, father, or priesthood leader who boldly protects, unflinchingly holds to truth, and gently leads them back to Christ and subsequently to an understanding of their potential in the church, home, and the world? Truly, the Apostle Paul did say it best. Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. May we more fully honor and respect that sacred truth, I humbly pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This presentation was given at Brigham Young University on October 25, 2002.